Thank you, Eric. Our next speaker is Stephen Mayen, who's a professor of structural engineering here at UC Berkeley and also director of the Pacific Earthquake uh, Engineering Research Center. Uh, and Stephen is uh, actively designing the next generation of earthquake safe buildings and structures, including bridges that not only remain standing uh, in an earthquake, but remain usable immediately after an earthquake, which for us in the Bay Area is critically important to relief and rebuilding when a quake hits. Great. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. I also was in Japan and came back just uh, one day prior to the earthquake, uh, and some of my colleagues were at the same meeting on urban earthquake engineering, and they had the great pleasure of being stuck in the uh, Narita Airport for two days, I believe, and uh, some uh, managed to stay in Tokyo, and uh, we had a report back from one of them uh, middle of last week on some of their early impressions of what happened there. Uh, I was asked to talk about will our buildings uh, hold up or be safe following an earthquake here in California. And I'd like to look at this in a little uh, a bit of a structure. You know, what do we mean by we here and what do we mean by hold up? What is our expectations and is it, uh, and for whom is that? You can also see, I think in this picture, that uh, we normally worry about ground shaking as the primary source of earthquake damage, but the earthquake in uh, March, uh, uh, earlier in March this year uh, in Japan was really the perfect storm. We had a, a, a very large area that was shaken fairly heavily. Uh, we had a tsunami and we also had fires. And you can see that there are likely to be also other aspects of this with public health problems associated with not having water, or water treatment facilities, a lot of toxic chemicals and certainly radiation going around the atmosphere, worrying about whether you can drink milk or eat sushi or drink water. Uh, and so there's some long-term consequence that bring together all of the expertise that we can provide from the sciences and from engineering. And so I like to try and look at this in some systematic fashion. So the question is, will our buildings hold up? All right, so uh, I think the first observation is that engineering and quality construction really matter. That if you go to uh, the news and look at uh, the reports of what happened in Pakistan and Indonesia and some parts of Turkey, uh, Wenchuan earthquake in China, there are hundreds or sometimes millions of houses that are damaged, uh, half a million people homeless, sometimes two or three hundred thousand people killed. And if you look then what happens in Chile, New Zealand, the United States, and even in Japan now, the fatalities are far smaller than that. And if you look at the engineered structures in Japan, there's very a few of new buildings that are highly damaged. And so uh, there's a great number of factors that influence the behavior of a structure, including the nature and characteristics of the earthquake, the proximity of the structure to the fault, the local soil conditions, the structure itself, and sometimes the contents that go into that. But this is uh, downtown Sendai, uh, two days after the earthquake, uh, and there's no damage. And this is an area where it was reported that we had close to 2G peak ground accelerations. And so there's some lessons that we have to look here. It appears that there is areas with great damage, but these are highly localized. And so I think some interaction between uh, seismologists and engineering seismologists and engineers uh, would be uh, very important to look at the reasons for this damage. But most of the shaking in Japan uh, was at or below the level that the Japanese uh, normally design for. So the question is, what are we designing for? So that when you want to buy your house in the Berkeley Hills or you want to take a, 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 a rental out for a store or something that you want to go into business with, the question is when somebody says, well, this was designed according to the building code, the first question is, what does that building code intend to, to be? So if your building was designed in 1917, according to the building code, it's not going to be anywhere close as good as it's going to be if it was designed last week, according to the building code. But even if it was designed last week and you look at the code, the codes are uh, intended to provide a minimum provision 
for design and construction of uh, structures to resist the effects of ground motions, but importantly to safeguard against major structural failures and loss of life, but there's no implication that they're trying to limit damage or to maintain function following the earthquake. So the perfectly designed, optimum, engineered solution for design level earthquake is that you can walk out the front door and you never go back in. So what we want to do is suboptimum design and have you be able to go back and restore your life to its normal situation. All right. So there's cases where people do this uh, for a lot of different applications. And so uh, the automobile industry has crumple zone and airbags. And people haven't established airbags yet for um, earthquake effects on structures. But maybe that's coming with some enterprising person, but you might expect that your structure is like this with fair amounts of damage, uh, but a permanent offset at the bottom of it that it might now be when the ground moves two meters in one direction, the building may decide to stay where it's at or move only a meter, and so the building has an offset like this. This becomes very difficult to uh, repair, especially if that's at the 15th floor of a 30-story building. And so uh, this is safe. This is what engineers are trying to do. You can walk out of the building uh, if it's a normal building, and uh, you can congratulate yourself on being alive and having survived the earthquake. Now, hospitals and nuclear power plants are designed to much higher standards, but the codes are minimum provisions uh, to, pub to safeguard public safety. All right? So you, if we're going to design a building, you should ask the engineer, can I design for something that I will have the building so that I can continue paying the mortgage for after 30 years or something like that? Uh, you know, so this is also a matter of risk and risk management. So earthquake engineering is really a matter of applying sound principles of dynamics and mechanics and so on to uh, a, a practical problem. But it's also a matter of making uh, informed, uh, risk informed trade offs in terms of the design process. And so if we have a general thing of what is the probability distribution for some response parameter ha happening like this, we'll get sort of a distribution like, like this. Uh, and the engineers then will try to design a structure that has a capacity greater than the um, uh, demand on the structure. And so the average capacity is greater than the average demand, but the probability that the demand exceeds some of the capacity of the structures is still a finite number. So there's going to be some probability of having then some damage, and engineers then focus on controlling that to what is an acceptable level. And what is acceptable is in the eye of the beholder. So in the last few weeks, there's been discussions, well, the Japanese should have known that this was going to be a big earthquake because in 896 or something like that, there was a big earthquake that was similar to this one. Well, there are extreme events, and so engineers, if they're concerned about this, and owners then would simply move the capacity of the structure over so that we can minimize the probability of some type of, of failure like, like that. And so performance-based earthquake engineering is a, a topic that has been around for now about 15 years. And so we're able to do that with some confidence, but there's a great uncertainty in each of the steps along the way. So how have we done? So if we do all new buildings perfectly, there's still a large inventory of buildings that were designed 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50, uh, and 100 years ago in some places. And so we've had history of Oakland nearby here of 17 or 18 years ago. Um, in Northridge, uh, there's been problems with the water supply systems. If you have a fire like in the Oakland Hills, you don't have water, you have some problems like this to fight the fires that uh, we might have. But if we get to modern buildings, you'll see something like the lower left-hand corner here. And when you go around and look at earthquakes, one of the identifiers of damage is not looking at the building like you might in Turkey or Indonesia or Pakistan and so on to see rubble on the ground, but you see the ubiquitous chain link fence where people are being kept out of the building. And so you can see that there's some panels removed here. And there's buildings in Northridge that had, there's more than 200 buildings in Northridge that had brittle fractures in the steel welded buildings, much like Soda Hall, same vintage of building, uh, that were fractured like this and had to be repaired. 
So lots of retrofits are underway in the state, and engineers and the public are working to mitigate that. On campus, we have a safer program that is retrofitting lots and lots of buildings or removing buildings that are not so safe. The whole Bay Area has some vulnerability to earthquakes from a number of faults in that area. Uh, to get some more information about that, the local Northern California chapter of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is just coming out with a new report of what would happen if we had a magnitude 7 earthquake on the Hayward Fault, which is not the biggest earthquake we could have, but it is a feasible representative fault. If you look at the economic studies from one of the insurance loss modelers here, you'll see that if we have a magnitude 6.8 on the southern part of the Hayward Fault, that the losses in billions of dollars, this is 99 billion, 96 billion, 99 billion dollars, those add up to 300 billion dollars. The reported damage from the Japanese earthquake is also $300 billion. So can this happen here? Yes. Your building, your building may be all right, but there's going to be lots of damage to lots of structures potentially. If the whole earthquake fault ruptures, then you can have something that adds up to about $600 billion just for the Hayward Fault. Like that. This is not just a California problem, Bay Area problem, but the entire United States is a problem. Uh, and so that some areas of the United States have earthquakes that are not anywhere near as prepared as California is. Uh, we have analytical methods to try and treat this for different locations in the United States. Uh, and so this is what engineers do So during our day job. But what we see now is that we don't want to design just for safety. What is the tendency now is to move toward life-safe structures and communities, but ones that are disaster resilient. So our challenge is to design structures that are not just safe, not just economical, but can be constructed quickly with minimum impact on the, re on the environment, but can withstand strong earthquake ground shaking, but with little disruption and cost associated with inspecting them and bringing them back to service. So there's examples of this in the Bay Area with seismic isolation and special damping uh, systems like in this building, but the San Francisco International Airport has isolators and things like that. So there's technology uh, that we can do this to try to avoid the same kind of damage that you saw in Japan. 